Welcome back to CressCon's afternoon sessions, hashtag CressCon for people who are social mediaing. I'm delighted to introduce Ken Munro, a partner in Pentest Partners, who will be giving us a whistle-stop tour of the aviation industry. Ken is a security entrepreneur and an industry maverick and has worked for in InfoSec for over 15 years. After studying applied physics, he did try his hand in the hospitality industry, but soon discovered a talent for hacking, persuading a till to print out mortgage amortizations. He went on to cut his teeth in the antivirus industry before founding SecureTest, a penetration testing business that established a reputation for delivering high spec services using a boutique business model. NCC Group recognised the value of the proposition and acquired that in 2007. But Ken has now found his calling and his penchant for pen testing saw him set up pen test partners in 2010. And now that boasts some of the best ethical hackers in the business, each of whom I'm proud to say has a stake in the firm. So without further ado, Ken, welcome. And I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Thank you. Gosh, thank you, Nicola. Uh, so. First things first, I only found out about this talk yesterday lunchtime, so um, it's perhaps not as slick and as well prepared as I'd hoped. Um, what, what I'd like to talk through is some of the research we've been doing over the last two, three years in the aviation sector. Um, it's going to be a whistle stop because there's a lot to cover, uh, a lot of interesting areas of research that we've uncovered, and also some, some good practice too. So come along for the journey, see what you make of it. Um, I hope that I can inspire some of you to start poking around with airplane systems safely, of course, and also make the leap and start seeing what you can do on airplanes as well. Um, so anyway, um, I want to dispel some of the myths about airplane hacking. You've seen there's been a lot of uh, stories in the press over the years. And I think one of the biggest and most important points is that the domains on the aircraft are fundamentally separate. So the bit up front, the, the pilot bit behind the cockpit door that does the uh, engines, flight controls, that's called the aircraft control domain. It's fundamentally separate from the rest of the passenger entertainment systems domain, which is down back, and the aircraft information services domain, which is the bit that the cabin crew use. They're fundamentally separate, which is kind of good news. Um, you kind of know who we are, uh, PTP. Uh, what's a little bit different about us is we have quite a few pilots on the team. I'm a pilot. I'm lapsed, but um, I've got a few hundred hours don't ever comply with me though i've had two engine failures and two gear hang-ups in in that time so yeah i'm wise uh we're also members of an advisory group that advises boeing on uh security uh, issues and i help organize the defcon um what's now the aerospace village used to be the Av aviation village that first started a couple of years back watch out for the aerospace village at defcon coming up there's loads and loads of amazing content coming up really excited about that over the last few years, we've got access to things like Airbus A320s, Boeing 747s. We've had the ability to work on electronic flight bags, in-flight entertainment systems, avionics, satellite communications, and more. And we've also presented some of that as research at various cons um, on collision avoidance systems, on instrument landing systems, and EFB security, which we're, we're working through at the moment. Um, the guy on the right, that's my colleague Alex, who's also a qualified pilot. Um, in the left-hand seat is another one of my colleagues who didn't want to be photographed for this one. Um, that's uh, actually Alex taking a PA-28 into on short final into the 2K, which is just on the northwest coast of France near Calais. Uh, I would say, and I think an overarching and important point I want to make is that you need to res disclose responsibly. Disclosure in aviation, to my mind, is a bit different. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. First of all, aircraft are in certified environments, which means that fixes have to be certified, which means it takes a long time to get issues um, diagnosed, fixed, confirmed as fixed, and then more in a more complex manner, pushed out to operators too. It takes a long time. Uh, I personally don't want to destabilize the aviation industry through bad press. They've had a pretty torrid time over the last 18 months through the coronavirus. So do expect long remediation times. Don't expect everything to be fixed on 90 days. Um, personally, we don't go dropping vulnerabilities after 90. We wait for full remediation by the vendor. There have been some challenges around disclosure, and I think fundamentally through a lack of understanding between researchers and the industry. Um, you probably all remember Ruben Santamata and the really cool bit of work he did in the 787 Dreamliner um, code. Um, fascinating, but I don't think Boeing were in a position at the time to really figure out how to deal with independent researchers. A lot of misunderstandings happened there and some fallings out. Um, in fairness, Boeing have completely changed their approach to vulnerability research. Um, they are now one of the most embracing organizations I think I've ever come across. They have completely done a 180 and are really, really good about receiving vulnerability reports and getting them fixed too. So what's changed? Well, 
I guess one of the silver linings, if you can call it that, of the coronavirus is that we've seen a lot of older airframes, more inefficient types are being retired. Uh, they're being laid up at a rate of knots, uh, which means that the breakers yards can't keep up. There's also a lot of parked out planes, not sure about their future, but a good example of this was a large number of the 747 fleet across the world have been parked up and retired. They've been around for long enough that they completely paid off their purchase cost. Uh, but unfortunately, in the face of modern twin engine long range planes, they're just not efficient. They're not economical in terms of uh, cost of operation per seat. So they've been laid up and there are lots of them knocking around and quite a few of them in the UK too. Uh, that has given rise to the potential for independent research for just about the first time. Yes, in the past, we did get access to retired planes, but it was sporadic and difficult because the planes would come in, they'd land, and the brokers' yards would want them in pieces, either so the parts could be resold or they could be turned into tin cans. Because the brokers' yards are backed up, there's now planes lying around that will never be flown again that are still functional, as in they power up and the systems work, but they're never going to fly again. Um, I'd also say one of the weird silver linings, as you probably see in recent press reports, is a lot of pilots have been um, put on uh, furlough, for example, or, or laid off for a period of time. And actually, we've, we've since hired a pilot, uh, a current 747 pilot, and uh, made for a really interesting pen tester. Uh, that methodical approach, that um, thinking about solving problems, has actually made for a really interesting skill set that's useful to us. But most of all, it's given us a much better understanding of what goes on up front. Now, yes, you know, we know the systems, we know how they work, but we don't day to day know how commercial pilots use them. And that's been fascinating, particularly when dealing with vulnerability disclosure with some recalcitrant uh, manufacturers who really didn't want to hear us. But actually when it was articulated in um, the terms of a pilot and their use, they started to listen and they started to take action, which was great. I would say pen testing avionics can be dangerous. Uh, the voltages, I'll talk about those in a moment, are high. Um, getting access to kit is difficult. Sometimes you get lucky on eBay. So I've got a few LRU, so line replaceable units and an old cockpit display unit from a 757 there. But these popped up on eBay. They are difficult to get hold of. Um, these are no longer certified, so they're cheap. Getting hold of operational components is incredibly expensive because certified components are still used today. So they have a value. Uh, the protocols are interesting, so you'll stumble onto things like uh, ARINC 429, which is one of the most common, which is a point-to-point -point protocol. It's not, not really a network as such. Um, so to decode it, you could use uh, a picoscope. Believe it or not, you can actually get the kit read out there. But you're starting to see tools emerge. So this is a, uh, US, a USB to ARINC 429 um, probe, which will record ARINC 429 data, which is the, the flight control data. Getting access to it isn't that easy. Decoding it isn't that easy. Injecting it is incredibly difficult. Uh, you've potentially got three synchronous um, injections to carry out on multiple parts of the airframe to get the flight controls to do anything. So practically taking control of the plane is is on, on the verge of being very, very difficult indeed. Um, also, some of the other protocols you might encounter on the Boeing 777, uh, there was an inductively coupled uh, network that uses a protocol called ARINC 629. The decoders for that are incredibly rare and very expensive. So that one um, we actually managed to borrow. It was $30,000 list to decode the protocol. We've got the inductive couplers. Uh, next step is to get hold of a 777 in order to play and see what we can find. Um, later protocols you'll see on the say, 350, 380, and Dreamliner, you'll find AFDX, which is much more uh, aligned with what we're used to on Ethernet networks. And in some cases, you can see near off the shelf switches being used. Um, so it's much easier to interface with those. But again, they also come with layers of security that you'd expect on an Ethernet-based network. Don't die when playing with airframes. The voltages, you're going to find 115 volts AC and probably 400 hertz down in the avionics bay. Uh, you might find 28 volts DC. Um, and one of the interesting things is if you want to get a, a vacuum cleaner, the ones you use on an aircraft, you don't use an off-the-shelf vacuum cleaner. You actually have to go and buy a Henry uh, vacuum cleaner that's specific to the purpose and very expensive. Uh, if you start taking apart avionics, particularly the primary or multifunctional flight displays, uh, there are going to be some meaty power capacitors inside some of the older CRT-based tubes. So be really careful. Uh, you might find a, a serious belt off a power cap if you're not being careful with that. Also, powering bench supplies can be frighteningly expensive as well. So it's not easy. 
You're also going to find a lot of legacy kit. So the plane's being retired. So the, the 747s I pointed out on the screen earlier are in one case 26, one case 28 years old. So you're going to find some really old legacy kit. But even with that, and this is a, a different 747 we were looking at, um, some of the components were still in use on an operational airframe. So you've got to be really careful that you're not going to do something that might affect other um, airworthy parts of the fleet. Uh, it's also very very easy for the press and the media to misunderstand aircraft security. That segregation of the aircraft control domains from the others is really, really important. And I think if people go to market without understanding the degree of segregation, the fiscal security, uh, the fact there's a pilot in the loop, two pilots in most cases, I think it's very easy for the media to understand, misunderstand and frankly lose their shit and start talking about plane hacking. Don't get me wrong, planes aren't perfectly secure. And I think some of the research I'll show will uh, will detail that but there are many many layers of defense and it takes a lot of lining up of the holes in the swiss cheese to cause problems for a bit of fun an example of some of the old stuff you're going to find so this is actually written up on our blog one of the cabin management terminals so that's the device that sits on the aisd so the aircraft information services domain and typically controls it's a management system for the in-flight entertainment system this particular device is in the cupboard under the stairs on the 747 and it's usually where the most senior member of the cabin crew will administrate the passenger systems from so it'll contain things like the passenger information list uh, 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 premium passenger information. It can do things like uh, use um, airborne telex or ACARs to communicate with ground stations. It could do uploads as well. Now, what was fun about this, it was Windows NT, Service Pack 4. So again, I don't know about you, I'm sure some of you working on older, perhaps government systems might see this from time to time, but I haven't seen NT4 um, in the wild for quite a while. So a lot of the dependency we wanted to use for maybe doing like a bash bunny style attack on it so we could quickly access it own it and get, get away again, um, it weren't going to work. A lot of the dependencies were missing. So it was back going back to find really old exploits and remembering how to work with NT. I've forgotten, frankly. Uh, again, multiple layers of defense here. So it's in the cupboard under the stairs. Yes, it's in a galley area, so there's going to be staff around a lot. But it's practical to think that someone could nip in there quickly, pop in a bash bunny or something like that, and knit back again. But even so, you're probably going to be on CCTV, and certainly none of the other passengers are going to be wondering, why on earth are you messing around with this system? But lots of fun stuff on there, and a great exercise in going back down memory lane again. You're also going to find some fun stuff. So every 30 days, the navigational database on the flight management system has to be updated. That's primarily to account for things like changes in navigational aids. And believe it or not, you get up front on a 747, you will find on most of them, you'll find a floppy disk, and that's where the navigational databases are upgraded from. Um, I've actually got in my hand one of the navigation based floppies, but it'd be a bit faff to de-share de -share the screen. But yes, I'm holding navigational floppies. That's not done like that so much anymore. Quite a few of the floppy disk interfaces on the 74s have been replaced with an ARINC connector that allows you to connect a portable maintenance terminal to do the updates. And increasingly, um, airplanes are starting to try to move towards things like gate link, which allows um, over the air updates when there's weight on wheels on the ground. It can um, derive significant efficiency from having to send a maintenance guy there with a terminal every 30 days to every single airplane to make sure it's airworthy to actually fly. The image on the right there, that's the uh, data loader from a 737. Uh, that's also done by floppy disk. And I've spoken to um, uh, aviation maintenance engineers who, yes, do go around with floppy disks, still but loading, right pane. If you get down into the avionics bay, you're going to find some interesting TAM tech down there. That's a uh, cockpit management unit that uh, uses a PC card, PCMCIA, who'd, who'd remember those. And on the right there, that's the quick access recorder. So that's the, um, the easy access version of the uh, black box. It's not rugged, but it's there so the, uh, um, any flight parameters can be very quickly downloaded. Uh, again, interfaced with a PC card. This one fortunately had an adapter to a CF card so we could get the data off there. And we're in the process of interpreting that. It conforms to some very interesting standards that we've got work to do to reverse engineer. I really want to get hold of a quick access recorder, but a lot of them are still in use and still, still have value. You'll also find some kit you're familiar with. Um, on the left-hand side, that is the, um, the one of the data loaders for the uh, cabin management terminal. So that's where you might upload manually, for example, um, IFE content. And on the right-hand side, that's, that's one of the fun areas. That's the avionics bay of an Airbus A320. Uh, if you ever get a chance, really interesting place to go and explore. Um, uh, there's also a video on our website of exploring the uh, avionics bay of a 747. Some of you might not be aware that there is genuinely a hatch from the first class area of the, the front of the plane down into the avionics bay. It's sat by seat 4A, so 
that bit, I think it was an executive decision with Steven Seagal where he attaches a stealth fighter to the bottom of the plane. Actually, you can, in, in this case, get access to the rest of the airplane from the avionics bay hatches. Uh, I think that's also the case in the 350 as well. Uh, you might also find uh, this is a slightly more modern in-flight entertainment system from a plane that I need to go back and revisit. Uh, you might find solid-state disks. Now, the RIC in this plane wasn't working. It wasn't accepting power anymore. So I think the next exercise is to go and image that disk and try and rebuild it in the lab and see what we can do with the RIC. One of the other major challenges we have is because these planes are all lined up on death row fundamentally, is it's really challenging to get access to the plane in the first place, hit a completely vanilla airplane with systems you almost undoubtedly never seen before. Even between aircraft, they're different. You've got to learn really quickly. You've probably got about eight hours to do the work. And ideally, what you do is go away, come back. But by the time you come back and book in to go and see it again, the plane's been taken apart. So it's you're really up against it. It's very, very time pressured. Um, for a giggle, we did genuinely find on quite an old A320, there was a C90 cassette in one of the LLUs in the avionics bay. We think it was doing the music as you entered the plane. But yeah, I don't think we're going to bother spending any time on that. Things get interesting as you start looking at some of the connectivity systems. So this is the in-flight entertainment connectivity system. This is the flight attendance panel, which is pretty much a mashup of this uh, cabin management panel and the FAP. Uh, it's in an area, again, under the stairs, but a bit more accessible. And we found a number of interfaces on there. We found exposed RJ45, which we could hit, uh, hook up an interface with. Also USB, which didn't have the data lines chopped, which was interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think we have to be practical about what you're going to achieve by compromising an IFE, certainly an older one anyway, is realistically, what's the worst you could do? Well, you could knock it out so you can't screen content so people get annoyed. Um, or you could put something destabilizing for the cabin crew. I don't know, maybe scare everyone silly. The plane's been hijacked. But is that really going to affect the, the safety of the flight? I'm not so sure. But in these cases, we have reported for vendors, and they've already locked down access to these, which is great. So that's good to see. Um, in this particular IFE, one of the things we did manage to recover from one of the um, interfaces, from the uh, some of the code we managed to extract, we found static credentials to an S3 bucket, which was great because it meant that we could hit up a ground system. Uh, we then spoke to the vendor, asked for permission to prove the vulnerability, proved it was read-write. And actually, from the ground, we could overwrite the uh, IFE content that was just uploaded when the plane landed. So you could put grot. It was automatically uploaded on the in-flight entertainment system. And yeah, that'd be a newsworthy instant, wouldn't it? Again, really responsive vendor, really good about it. Um, they fixed it very, very quickly. Uh, and that no longer um, is a problem. Again, we recovered the complex credential from the on-plane system. So you need physical access for a significant period of time, which I don't think is realistic in the real world. Physical security controls at airports are generally good. And if you've got problems with third parties accessing your planes and being left alone for extended periods of time, I think you've got deeper problems. We also managed in this particular case to um, force the IFE into a maintenance mode, which meant you could um, effectively make it useless for passengers. But again, really, not a huge issue. We did discover that from the avionics bay, we, there was another interface, another ILU we could uh, connect to that allowed us to up, upload arbitrary content. But that would have meant us accessing the plane through the external um, avionics bay hatch through a ladder, plugging into it, uploading content, and then getting out again. It kind of reminded me of that bit in Scorpion, the TV show about plane hacking, where the uh, Ferrari was driving along the runway. It's kind of impractical. I don't think it's a real world attack to you, but it was funny for the TV anyway. Things get more interesting as you start looking at the connectivity system. So this particular plane had an in-flight Wi-Fi router. Um, for cost efficiency, typically the, um, da the uplinks to get data actually downlinks. They, they'll use 4G LTE downlinks um, facing down at ground stations rather than uh, downloading expensive SATCOM data. But that's only available over land. So when you go over the oceans, then it'll use upward facing SATCOMs. Now, <laughs> what made me chuckle, again, it's just like every other bloody pen test you ever do, is that the credentials wireless router were written on a piece of paper on the door that um, that which, which the uh, Wi-Fi router sat behind, and that had no key on it. That was fun. That's been fixed. The only thing that was a little annoying was that it looked like the uh, the router had been deactivated, so the, the data plan had been deactivated when the plane was retired. So it was a little limited. Um, really want to get our hands on that. But again, this is a certified product, extremely expensive to buy. That could easily be 15 to 20,000 pounds worth of kit, if not more. You're probably also familiar um, when we're sitting in the economy, uh, every three seats or so, the little box that obstructs your legroom, that's the seat box. That's fundamentally a, uh, a power a switch that was used historically to um, take protocols like DOCSIS 
from back in the day to stream media at uh, high enough bandwidth back when Ethernet really didn't do it. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you'll find that the seat boxes themselves haven't been replaced, but simply um, the same protocols are just streamed through them. So when you pop them apart, you'll find some really, really old stuff inside. Um, and you do occasionally find these pop up on eBay. Um, again, this plane's been retired, so there's not a lot you can take from it. And you're starting to see IFE move much more towards tablets. So these seat boxes just aren't present anymore. Um, this is the example I was showing you. If you've got access from the electronic, the, sorry, the avionics bay, uh, you've got access to things like RJ45 in some cases, and also a serial interface there we found with default creds on it, which was fun. But you've got to be inside the avionics bay to do this. You do find really old OSs. There's no surprise because the planes are old. Sometimes you find a real mishmash. So the OS of the later IFE uh, was about four years out of, um, old compared to the NT4 example we found. You're going to find really old hardware, but it doesn't really reflect the state of flying today because the stuff that's in the air right now hasn't been retired. So it's much more recent and much, uh, much better security. And I also think that physical security is a valid control in the aviation sector. It's not easy to get into and behind some of the bays that you need to get to to do these. Again, things get interesting. So uh, the SATCOMs, uh, there'll always be SATCOMs in a plane. You might not necessarily have um, uh, access to it as a passenger. There may not be on, uh, Wi-Fi on board for passengers, but there'll always, almost always be SATCOMs on board for the, um, the pilots. You'll find uh, the satcom terminal unit in the 747 is actually in the overhead about halfway down the cabin uh, above the economy seats you need to take the panels apart and get up and you can get access to it but again the um the interfaces to it are all arink 429 you're not going to find rj45 in there um i'm hoping to be able to borrow one of these satcom terminals from one of the breakers shortly but again they're still in use and very expensive so reverse engineering has to be very very careful an area that we have spent a lot of time over the last few uh, months looking at is that of the electronic flight bag. Now, as a primer, what's an EFB? Well, every pilot will carry something like an iPad. And using that iPad, the idea is, first of all, you don't have to carry around paper charts, so you save a lot of weight. It's also a lot easier to keep them up to date. Uh, so charts are really important. It's um, almost impossible to approach an airport if you don't have the correct approach chart. Yeah, you could get a radio talk down, um, but again, much, much more time consuming and will occupy a lot of uh, radio communications. Another major use for the electronic flight bag is the use of what's called performance or PERF. Now, it might be aware that when an aircraft takes off, it's very rare for the pilots to use full throttle very rare indeed. Uh, if you've got a long enough runway, the rin's in the right direction, you're not too heavy, pressure altitude's right, it's very rare that you're going to need full, full power. So in the case of a 737, you'd actually derate the amount of power you use from, I think it's between 67% and 100% power. But that calculation is really important and uses lots of different factors. And that's where your electronic flight bag comes in. Now, we have found a number of vulnerabilities in electronic flight bags. They're going through disclosure right now with varying degrees of response from, um, from amazing and being fixed right now to trying to deny everything we've ever said. Uh, so we've actually written our own ele um, electronic flight bag application that kind of replicates some of these vulnerabilities. I'm not naming them today. That data is critical for creating the correct D-rate or flex calculation. Um, it, the way you D-rate varies between Boeing and Airbus and other types. In the case of an Airbus, because of the way the throttles work, there'll be a setting on there, if you look carefully, it says FLX or flex temp. Now, the way you do a calculation in Airbus is you gather all the data and that will come out with a temperature. And you put that temperature into flight management computer and that will then tell the um, engines how much power to use for takeoff. In the case of Boeing, it's called D-rate. It's done slightly differently, but it'll still be a percentage of power that you allocate. Now that information that goes into the calculation will come from lots of different sources. So it might come from, uh, it might come over VSAT, so from your satellite communications. In some cases that come from um, uh, web APIs, so you can um, connect your electronic flight bag to mobile data and connect to it and do the calculation. We found challenges in the uh, in vulnerabilities in these mobile apps that mean that in theory you could tamper with the performance calculation and cause the incorrect information to be output to the pilot. Now, what that will do, if you provide the wrong uh, flex temp in the case of an Airbus, that means that what goes wrong is your V speeds are wrong. Now, V speeds, you probably know, is V1. Is the, temp is the point um, after which if an engine packs up, you can't stop on the runway. 
and v2 is the speed at which uh, you can safely fly away and the gap between v1 and v2 is quite a scary time because if something goes pop you're going to go off the end of the runway vr is the point at which you rotate and the d rates um, or flex temp calculations will then um, populate your v speeds which tell you what um, speed you need to get to there have been numerous cases over the years where pilots themselves have incorrectly put the wrong data into their electronic flight bag. So they've come up with the wrong derate calculation. They go off piling off down the runway and rotate, and the plane doesn't unstick. So in that case, you commonly get what's called a tail strike, where the tail hits the ground until the plane finally flies away. Or in a very small number of cases, very sadly, there have been runway excursions or overruns, and even a small number of cases, there have been a couple of hull losses and fatalities as well. This happens by mistake. Good pilots will instantly recognize the mistake and go full power, take off, go around power, and off you go, and everything's fine. You just rolled a bit further down the runway than you expect. However, opportunities to introduce issues concern me. That's why we found vulnerabilities, and that's why we reported them responsibly, responsibly, and they are going through remediation right now. There are two primary types of EFB. I've talked mostly about uh, tablet-based, so a portable electronic flight bag. There are also installed electronic flight bags, which you find in some types. Um, I've got a very tight crop of an EFB here that we found on the 747. And the calculations are done on this. This particular EFB was a Windows tablet. It was running Windows CE, if I recall correctly. And the lockdown on it was almost non-existent. It was a classic entertaining kiosk breakout that took about 10 seconds for one of my colleagues to do, and that gave us uh, full control over the FB. So we could do anything at that point. We could modify databases behind it, modify calculations in the apps and all sorts. Again, reported responsibility. Responsibly, it's being fixed right now. But there's more than just pure safety data. So the EFB will contain things like your electronic passenger information list. It will contain your weight and balance, which you can't take off with prop without being done correctly because all sorts of problems. There's some really interesting uh, area accident reports where weight and balance has been wrong. Uh, if you don't have, for example, your quick reference handbook, so when there's an incident uh, that needs to be dealt with quickly, like an engine out, for example, you quickly grab your QRH. They're now digital, electronic, they're on the EFB. There's all sorts of other things that we're working on at the moment, looking for security vulnerabilities to report and get fixed. So the EFB is a really, really interesting area. There are lots of challenges we've been finding with the EFBs over the last six months or so. There's definite gaps between one of the manufacturers of the, of the software and devices and the operators, so airlines, um, their understanding about security. Um, there's definitely responsibility misunderstandings. Um, they think it's them, they think it's the other. Um, there's Definitely some operators, so airlines thinking that um, manufacturers follow defense in depth, and I assure you they don't always on EFBs. Um, there's also been some real variety in disclosure as well. So one was amazing, utterly responsible. Others were just trying to um, well, play the issue down, shall we say. There are definitely challenges around regulation. So uh, AMC 2025A is really worth reading if you're into aviation um, regulations, they're quite fun. And I think there's some um, challenges around, so for example, some um, regulators have authority over installed electronic flight bags because it's part of the air airframe, where it's portable, they have less authority over that. Um, other areas we're looking at at the moment, there's a lot of work on our website around ACARS, which is the, um, the digital messaging system that works over RF. TCAS I'll talk about, that's an example of a portable data loader. Um, we're also working on reverse engineering some cockpit display units. Um, there's lots to be done on ACARS uh, and stuff there as well. Uh, you might remember some fun we did last summer where we reverse engineered a, uh, a 5G BioShield USB key. And there was a lot of uh, people getting very antsy about 5G and radiation. Now, there is an area where 5G is quite interesting, is it does um, arguably interfere with radio altimeters from aeroplanes. Uh, the frequencies um, are very close together, not as well spaced as they might be, and some of the older um, radio altimeters don't have such good um, ability to um, defend against 5G issues. So particularly, your, five, your radio altimeter is essential in a Category 3 approach. That's when there's no visibility. So you need your radio altimeter to inform the autopilot at what point you're, you're, you're how high you are above the runway which then it starts the flare. Uh, if you think about where 5G is going, think about Heathrow, M25 is on short finals. So there's areas that are being worked on at the moment to improve um, separation and the ability of radio altimeters to uh, stop um, issues being caused. There have already been a few reported problems. Again, only a problem really in Cat 3, uh, where you have no visibility, so fog. Um, but this needs a lot more research, and I know that there's work going on from the FAA right now. 
there was some good research from Northwestern University uh, looked at instrument landing system spoofing. So again, if you're approaching in fog, you'll see bottom right, that's our simulator. We, we actually have an Airbus A3, A320 simulator. So it means we can recreate a lot of um, these issues. We also have a rated 320 pilot as well. So he can take us through how exactly how um, uh, these attacks work. You'll see from the instrument landing system crosshairs on the PFD on the left that we're aligned on the ILS. It's outside, it's cat three, it's foggy, so you don't see anything. But when you land, you'll see that actually we've broken out of cloud um, about a mile to the west of the runway, that's San Francisco, but you see the ILS crosshairs are still aligned. It's really worth reading this paper. Um, it talks about some of the practicalities of doing the spoofing. Talking to pilots, the real world is more likely that a spoofing attempt will actually simply pop up the nav flags on the instrument landing system so they know that it's unreliable data. So they'll probably go around and find somewhere else or hang around until the spoofing problem goes away. We've also looked at collision avoidance system spoofing. So to stop planes flying into each other, there's a, a, a collision avoidance system between the two transponders on the airplanes. If they see two planes about to crash into each other, one will immediately go climb, climb, the other will go descend, descend, and uh, any smart pilot will very quickly follow that, uh, what's called a resolution advisory. Um, it is possible to introduce uh, spoof signals to cause fake resolution advisories. And we've done some work with the group at AVSEC Oxford, and again, another really interesting group that's worth talking to. Uh, they did some effect on the human aspects of this and show that in the event of a, a rogue resolution advisory, the most common response would be actually for the pilot to turn the TCAS system off. So effectively, you cried wolf, which isn't great, um, but really worth reading up on. Um, as I wrap up, there's also some interesting stuff to be done in the area of GPS spoofing. Now, we all know various nations GPS spoof around certain areas, particularly around military bases. As we move to more and more reliance on GPS, we're starting to see ground-based navigational aids retired. So you know, when I first learned to fly, I was using ADFs, so the NDBs, uh, VORs, and other instrument landing systems. They're expensive to maintain. And increasingly, we're seeing GPS-based approaches published. So why would you therefore carry on with your great expensive ground-based nav aid when you've got a perfectly good service of GPS? Talking to um, various researchers in the space, um, when you're out over the oceanic tracks, you typically have immersional reference systems uh, as a backup. Now, drift in IRS is possible. And talking to experts on the subject, uh, a drift of about four, four meters per second is possible on GPS without setting off inertial reference systems alerts. The problem is, is practically how you're going to G uh, GPS spoof a plane at altitude. It takes a signal from above, so you've either got to be flying above it, which is a bit impractical. The most likely um, challenge is going to be from that GPS spoof being on board. Um, there are a number of airfields, particularly around um, air, hilly areas or mountainous areas in the USA, where it wouldn't take too much to cause issues with a GPS approach in Cat 3 conditions, um, particularly where there's no nearby ground nav aids. But there's a huge amount more research done to look at the practicality of this and whether it is a threat or whether it's actually just a, a bit of a challenge that needs um, worked around with operating procedures. Um, a bit of advice. We all know you don't make assumptions about security. Device manufacturers, I think it's fair to say, from our experience, have got a very different view of security compared to other organizations. There's a lot of legacy in aviation. If you think you've seen old systems in government, come and get on a plane with me. And uh, we've been working really hard to get a industry to open up and work with and engage with researchers. So through groupings like the Aviation ISAC, through the Desk on Aerospace Village and others, also working with people like the FAA and CAA and EASA. Um, I would say, um, there's a lot of further reading today. We've blogged about this. There's a lot of other sources of really good data too. So if aviation security is your thing, please go and spend some time reading up about it. There's so much untapped, so much that hasn't been looked into yet. We've been banging this drum for three years and we're not even close to understanding it. What I would say is we have now got consistent access to a 747. And I'm hoping later on in the year, coronavirus dependent, to be able to open it up so that we can hold some uh, learning events and training events out there on that plane a little bit later in the year. So if that's something of interest to you, do drop us a line. It'll be open to the community. Um, I'm hoping we'll be able to do it for free, but a really interesting hands-on, first of all, explore a plane, see how they work, talk to pilots, understand what they do and how they'd operate them. But more importantly, let's look at the systems better and understand what security vulnerabilities might be there. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ken. And uh, despite your invite to come with you on a plane, I, I don't think I will, as you've killed two engines, which you, you mentioned earlier. Um, we have got some questions. So one of the questions is, what level of pen testing do the aircraft manufacturers, in, in your experience, and component suppliers employ? OK, uh, that's a really good question. So I know that many of the manufacturers do have some in-house teams. And actually, I've seen some of the, the test beds in Boeing. I got a tour. Well, one of my colleagues got a tour of the Everett factory. And I've been incredibly impressed with some of the test beds they've got because they can actually power up all the components. They do do quite a bit of pen testing themselves. I personally don't think they're enough. I suppose I would say that. We would say that. Um, but what we're seeing more is it tends to be in the supply chains where I think there are more problems. The manufacturers themselves are pretty responsible. They get it. I think it's the component manufacturers. I think it's some of the service providers where some of the more of the problems lie. And that's where we're, we're doing a lot of work now, hence why we're looking at electronic flight bags. And um, on, on that note, um, do you think there is enough regulation currently or that that should be increased? Uh, as well, a really interesting point that you raised there, actually, is because um, a good example is the FAA doesn't really have purview over um, portable electronic flight bags. And I talk to pilots who give their flight bags to their kids to watch Netflix on. So all those lockdowns that you know we follow in in corporate world, um, simply you find in many cases they're just not followed to the same degree. And I don't think it's understood that the AFB is a safety critical device. So there's a lot of learning there. And I think a lot of leadership from the various regulators, but also that they need to start to regulate in areas that perhaps they didn't have um, oversight of previously. And I, I love that your answers are almost segues into the next question that we've been asked because uh, um, so Obviously, you, you talked about responsible disclosure earlier, and you've just mentioned a few things that you, you just discovered in talking to people. How easy are the routes in to disclose, and what kind of responses are you typically seeing? Um, varied. So both the FAA and EASA can help you with responsible disclosure if you're struggling. Um, the Aviation ISAC is also quite a good resource as well. Um, the challenge with the ISAC is they typically move at the speed of the slowest member, um, which, which is fine. Um, it, it's, it's a job about educating a whole industry at once. The ISAC can help you too. They've been really helpful about opening doors to get us through to the right people so you don't end up having to have a difficult, ignored email conversation. The ISAC are good. I, I can help. It. I'll gladly introduce anyone to the ISAC if they'd like to have a conversation with them. The FAA have a disclosure program too, as do most of the airframe manufacturers as well. Well, um, some of them are definitely better. Some have vulnerability disclosures programs that are really baked into their culture. Others, in my experience, it's more of a page on a website. It's okay. We won't we won't ask you for a whistleblowing page on uh, on that particular <laughs> one. And um, on a lighter note, because I I think I've seen this on MythBusters. Um, why do you have to turn your mobile phone off? And would you fly on a plane that could be compromised by a mobile phone? <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I, I, I really don't know. I, I think in the case of some early components, maybe there were some issues. There are some. There has been some anecdotal suggestions of autopilots tripping out, but those those were a long time ago, and I've I really don't see that anymore. Sneaky suspicion that it's more psychological, and it's so that you focus on the safety briefing. Yeah, but. if you want to have a bit of fun, throw up um, a Wi-Fi snipper on a plane and see how many people are leaving their phones on Wi-Fi. <laughs> so, not suggesting you should do that, of course. And on that note, on that bombshell, as they would say, I uh, I think uh, we, we've run this to the end. Thank you so much, Ken. I've, I've really enjoyed that again. And seeing your spooky twins, which uh, I have many fun memories of uh, at various events. Um, so thank you again for, for stepping in and, and doing this talk. Really, really appreciate it, as always. Thanks all. Okay. Um, so we will be going to lunch, everybody. So feel free again to do social media on Crestcon. Um, for all of our uh, people speaking, you can uh, close the, the main screen slightly so you can see the questions on the side. And we'll be going to lunch and coming back at, let me just check for you, um, 1.30. So at 1.30, next presentation is Keith Driver of this a um, company called Titania, which I hear is a mover and a shaker in the industry. So hopefully you'll catch him soon. Thank you very much. I've been Nicola Whiting of Titania and hope to speak and see you later. Bye.